People have lived along the coast of Prince William Sound and the Gulf of Alaska for as long as 7,000 years, and they have lived well. Throughout history, they have lived off the sea and the land, which have provided them with food and the raw materials for tools, clothing, and shelter. The resources have been bountiful, and the communities have survived and often thrived. On March 24, 1989, a tanker dumped 11 million gallons of oil into the waters around them, threatening their way of life. The oil spill was a nightmare. The communities have endured natural tragedies in the past, like earthquakes and epidemics. But the oil spill surprised and confused like nothing seen before. Although hundreds of oil tankers cross the waters each year to and from the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Terminal in Valdez, industry was unprepared for the possibility that one might someday come to grief. The worst happened when the Exxon Valdez went aground on Bly Reef in Prince William Sound. The word pristine wilderness to describe Prince William Sound became a cliche after the spill. Still, it is true. The beauty of the sound and along the coast where the oil traveled is truly staggering. In addition to its wildlife, Prince William Sound is home to several communities. Tatitlik is the oldest, predating Valdez, Cordova, and Whittier by hundreds of years. Chiniga Bay might have been even older, but it had to uproot from a previous location because of the great earthquake in 1964 and move some 25 miles to its present location on Evans Island. Bly Reef is less than five miles from Tatitlik. By fortune and the tides, the massive oil slick did not reach Tatitlik. Instead, it drifted the other way, carried by the current west across the sound, washing ashore along hundreds of miles of beaches. It tarred more beaches along the southern coast of the Kenai Peninsula, the Kenai Fjords. It nosed into Cook Inlet, past English Bay and Port Graham, and swept toward the Kodiak Islands and the 12,000 people who live there. The oil extended to beaches in the Katmai National Park and to five more villages on the Alaska Peninsula. Harvest surveys show that residents of villages in the oil spill area consume 300 to 500 pounds per person of wild resources gathered from the sea and land over the course of a year. Many also engage in commercial fishing and other commercial activities, but the gathering of subsistence resources is the basis of their culture and their way of life. This is what the oil spill threatened. Tatitlik may have been spared the worst of the oil, but its but residents felt village, the full uh, weight nonetheless. You, you knew you could always count on that your husband was a good hunter and that he, uh, you know, could provide for your family and, and uh, you know, it was something that you were confident about, you know, until after the oil spill, uh, it, it just made so many doubts and in, in, uh, raised a lot of doubts in, in your mind, you know, is that, is it still going to be safe to eat, you know? Chiniga Bay, more than 50 miles across the water on the far side of Prince William Sound, stood in the immediate path of the oil, and beaches around it took a direct hit. Don Kompkoff, a council leader in Chiniga Bay, remembers the day the oil arrived. Most of it came in, came in and hit those islands out here and it crossed over in Latouche. And uh, we had a deflection boom here that kept most of it out, you know, and, uh, and some of the oil hit the beaches over on the, on the island there toward, toward the hatchery. The hatchery, just down the beach from Chiniga Bay, faced a full onslaught but residents of the communities in the Sound were able to boom off the hatchery. It was clear from the start that the spill had profound implications for public health. If the oil harmed life in the marine and coastal environment, it could also affect life in the communities. In the days after the spill, no one knew what the oil would do. 
One of the first to hear the concerns was John Mattoon, a U.S. Public Health Service doctor, whose rounds included the villages in Prince William Sound and Lower Cook Inlet. The spill occurred right in the villagers' own backyard and in, in affected areas where they would be um, subsistence food gathering and uh, there was initial concern about the toxic effects, exposure to the fumes, um, exposure to the oil itself and amongst the people who were involved in the cleanup activities and the long-range concerns uh, as to how it would affect water quality and food quality um, long into the future. There were a lot of unknowns at that time. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game Subsistence Division was quick to recognize the threat posed by the oil. When the spill occurred, we had people on staff who were ready to go to those communities and find out what issues were were being raised by local residents, what kind of questions they were asking about the spill, about the effects of the spill on, on resources, on their subsistence uses. So very early on, we felt that it was our responsibility because of our long-term familiarity and connection with these villages to, to go there and, and find out what people were, were asking and, and thinking about. In April and May, subsistence researchers met with leaders in the villages to decide the most important areas for testing. With the help of the villages, researchers collected fish, clams, mussels, and an octopus from areas near Tatitlik and Chiniga Bay and from Port Graham and English Bay in Lower Cook Inlet. The samples were inspected by local residents to see if they looked or smelled oily. They were sent to the Division of Environmental Conservation Laboratory in Palmer. Here they were again inspected by sight and smell, and the fish, after being heated in a microwave oven, were also tested by taste. Clams were not tasted because of the chance they might contain paralytic shellfish poisoning, a danger apart from any oil contamination. About 10 samples were also sent to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration facilities for more extensive tests. Scientists were looking for aromatic hydrocarbons, the toxic remains of the oil. There are two types of these hydrocarbons, called light aromatics and heavy aromatics. Both types may be poisonous. The light aromatics can cause acute or sudden illness. They have a strong smell, however, and tainted food is easy to identify. The other type of hydrocarbon may cause long-term problems, like cancer and other diseases, after prolonged exposure. They may not have a strong smell, and they last longer in the environment. The DEC's organoleptic tests, as the sight, smell, and taste tests are called, revealed no oil contamination in any of the samples except for some clams and mussels from Windy Bay a heavily oiled beach around the tip of the Kenai Peninsula from English Bay. Field notes showed the local gatherers had also reported the samples looked and smelled oily. The samples were also scanned with a fluorescent light designed to highlight any traces of oil. Again, only the Windy Bay samples tested positive. We have found no contamination on finfish. We have had a lot of suspect areas but everything has been negative as far as the organoleptic evaluation. The Windy Bay mussels were grossly contaminated. They were dripping with crude oil or moose. I guess at that point in time it would be classified as moose. They were dripping. There was no, there can be nothing but positive. They smell, you open the bag, they smell of crude oil. You looked at it, you smelled it in your hands, it smelled of crude oil. You opened them up, everything that you touched was contaminated with crude oil. FDA tests showed the same thing. All but the two samples from Windy Bay tested within normal ranges for aromatic hydrocarbons. The preliminary indications were that organoleptic testing was a valid way to determine whether food was contaminated. This meant that people could take steps to protect themselves against contamination. The advice at the time was to be very selective in choosing the site that they gather the food. Look around, be aware, ask other people. If there'd been oil seen in the area, the safest and most conservative advice would be not to use that area for food gathering purposes. If they knew of a beach which uh, hadn't 
been contaminated or was well away from the uh, oil spill, um, it was felt that those shellfish were, would be safe to eat. Um, the uh, early advice was to use the uh, sniff test to look and to smell and if uh, any de detectable levels of hydrocarbons were present, not that, that odor, um, the advice was not to eat those shellfish. Meanwhile, events were moving on other fronts. Exxon was also conducting a sampling effort to test subsistence seafoods. Dr. Tom Nyswander, a public health service so physician at the Alaska Native Medical Center in Anchorage, saw a need for a group to sort through the studies that would be coming in and provide accurate information about their findings. Uh, we were overwhelmed. Not only did uh, people from the state and uh, the RIM show up, but we had folks there from uh, the National Institutes of Occupational Safety of Health, the uh, AFL-CIO representing workers, the uh, University of Washington, the Subsistence Division of Fish and Game, and I, to this date, I, I don't know how they all got there, who invited them, but there was obviously a, a lot of interest. Uh, we, after that meeting, decided that we would, uh, we would get together every two weeks to find out what we knew and what we didn't know about the oil spill. Um, try to figure out some kind of strategy to start answering questions that people from the villages were going to be asking us. And, um, and, and that's how it began. The Oil Spill Health Task Force organized as an informal group of government and private agencies and has met regularly at the Alaska Native Medical Center. Because of the public health concern, the state and Exxon agreed to cooperate in their studies of the spill on subsistence resources. The task force became the sounding board where the studies were discussed and their results reviewed. Key to the effort was the role of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. NOAA coordinated the subsistence studies by Exxon and the Division of Subsistence, and samples from both studies were tested at NOAA's Environmental Conservation Division Laboratory in Seattle. NOAA also joined with Exxon in a major study of subsistence seafood in Prince William Sound, Lower Cook Inlet, and the Kodiak Islands area. The Seattle Laboratory tested tissue from more than 350 samples of fish and shellfish collected in July, August, and September of 1989, and also tested bile from gallbladders in fish. The tests confirmed what scientists at the laboratory already suspected. By analyzing, we have so far found that we practically find no contamination in fish uh, and uh, marine mammal tissues as, uh, uh, because of their ability to convert these compounds and get rid of them. On the other hand, we do find in clams and mussels uh, taken from a number of sites such as Windy Bay and uh, Chenega and some of the areas that where the oil had uh, there was a, a obvious impact of the oil that we do find high levels of uh, hydrocarbons in their tissues which uh, showed that indeed all of these animals are able to absorb the oil from their environment but the fish and uh, mammals have a way of getting rid of them from their system. Uh, doing so they may get damaged themselves but their edible flesh remains uh, somewhat free of the contamination. Yes. The laboratory tests the samples by two methods. The first and easiest method is used to test bile from fish. During the process, a fluorescent light is flashed on the bile. The aromatic hydrocarbons show up on different wavelengths in the light and are recorded on a graph. The test is used to select fish samples for the second method of testing. In the second method, Tissue samples are run through an elaborate cleanup process to concentrate the hydrocarbons and then heated to a temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. The procedure can identify some 35 different hydrocarbons and measures them in quantities lower than one part per billion. The bile tests showed that some fish had been exposed to oil, but the tissue tests showed none or very little of the contaminants in their edible flesh. Most shellfish also tested at very low levels, but some tested much higher. 
The highest levels were found in clams and mussels from Windy Bay. Higher than normal levels of hydrocarbons were also found in shellfish from the Kodiak Boat Harbor, Chiniga Bay, and Old Harbor. After test results became available in late August, a committee of toxicologists was established by the Oil Spill Health Task Force and NOAA to review the results. The expert committee reviewed the study and issued a preliminary summary of its findings in September and a final report in January 1990. The first and most important question the committee answered was, are Alaskan subsistence seafoods from the oil spill area safe to eat? For fish, the answer was yes. Levels of aromatic hydrocarbons found in the fish were very low and are similar to levels in fish from areas unaffected by the oil spill. All fish that were tested are safe to eat, the committee said. However, some shellfish in heavily oiled areas, especially bivalves like clams and mussels, may be contaminated. The bivalves filter water to feed and may pick up pollutants in the water. They do not have an efficient way of ridding themselves of the chemicals as fish and mammals do. The toxicologists recommended that if clams and mussels are eaten, they should not be collected from areas that are obviously contaminated with oil. The toxicologists said that the subsistence tests were, in a sense, breaking new ground. No studies were found from previous oil spills that addressed the possibility of transfer of contaminants through the food chain to man. More studies were needed, the committee said. People need to understand that we don't live in a risk-free environment and in fact that hydrocarbons are found in many different kinds of foods that we eat including all the smoked foods, things like smoked hams and smoked turkeys and certainly the smoked fish that's prepared uh, traditionally all have hydrocarbons uh, in them. Likewise, there are people inhale a lot of hydrocarbons when they smoke and so when you put this all together and ask me what is the um, danger from eating uh, subsistence foods from the oil spilled area, I'd say compared to other things that we eat, it's going to be relatively minor, except for the exceptions of where you're con collecting foods from heavily oil spilled, uh, heavily oiled beaches. The studies are continuing. Samples were collected in two cycles during the winter and spring months of 1990, and both Exxon and the state plan to continue sampling during the summer. Plans beyond the summer were uncertain, however. The state's study has three parts. It is a trend assessment to keep track of species and sites already tested to see how levels of hydrocarbons may change over time and it conducts special assessments on other species and sites considered to be important subsistence resources by local residents. Perhaps most central to the response has been a continuation of the subsistence foods collection and testing program. And in three phases, a winter phase, a spring phase, and a summer phase, division researchers are continuing to visit the communities in the oil spill area and to collect resources for hydrocarbon testing. The third part of the study involves a harvest survey of households in the communities. Exxon's study is also continuing. Exxon continues to uh, conduct a sampling program to monitor the beaches or subsistence beaches around villages to to do a couple things. One is to make sure that we do uh, continue to have good results uh, and confirm the results from last year. And the other is just to be able to extend uh, confidence to the people and assure them that uh, in areas where th there are no problems, there continues to be no problems, and uh, just to raise that level of confidence that people need to, to help them get out there and do their subsistence uh, uh, gathering. Uh, last year was highly disruptive and we feel that the faster that people can get back to normal traditional lifestyles, uh, both better off for them and, and in reality for Exxon as well. Meanwhile, more results are becoming known. More than 20 seals and sea lions have been tested and more were scheduled. The marine mammals had very low levels of hydrocarbons, levels similar to those found in the lowest testing fish. Deer and ducks were being tested, as well as other species of sea life. 
By the end of the summer, most of the information from the subsistence studies should be known. But it may be that any amount of information will not be enough for residents of Alaska's communities that rely on the resources. The aromatic hydrocarbons, this, this one in the lower end of the spectrum, uh, can be detected with very small, very, very low levels of hydrocarbons can be detected organoleptically. But unfortunately, with time, they would go out of the environment. And the other hydrocarbons, which are on the higher molecular weight, as you go along from the lower molecular weight with one ring, and it goes up higher and higher, these compounds are highly persistent in our environment. Bacteria cannot uh, easily degrade them. They are not, they do not get evaporated. They are not very water soluble and get settled down in our, uh, in the bottom sediment. They also, because they are not volatile, they don't have any distinct odor. And it is not possible to detect them by organoleptic test. Nothing is more important to residents of Alaska's coastal villages than the health of their resources. If those resources are damaged, it comes home first to them. It would appear from the subsistence food studies that fish, at least, remain good to eat. But shellfish in areas that were heavily contaminated with oil remain a problem. Clams and mussels especially are very susceptible to any pollution in the water. If they are exposed to oil chemicals, they will take them up. Clams and mussels in heavily oiled beaches should be considered unsafe to eat. So far, the news about subsistence seafoods has been good, especially about fish, but uncertainties still remain from the oil spill. The subsistence studies are among only a few whose findings have been released to the public. Dozens of other studies are being conducted by Exxon, the state of Alaska, and federal agencies on the effects of the oil spill on natural resources and the marine environment. Findings from these studies will be used in court in determining damages and restoration goals. That's not soon enough for coastal villagers. If wildlife was injured in any way, if oil remains anywhere in the food chain, they will be the first to suffer. One such place is English Bay, near the point where the Gulf of Alaska bends into Lower Cook Inlet. English Bay was the first Russian settlement on mainland Alaska, established in 1785. The area was inhabited for hundreds of years before then by Aleuts, and has been inhabited continually since. It is easy to see why it has been a popular settlement. A salmon stream empties on the far side of the village, and a reef in front of the village is exposed at low tide. The sea beckons beyond. On a warm day in late April, during a low tide cycle, Seraphim Yukonish, a bilingual teacher at the English Bay School, takes his class of seventh and eighth graders down to the reef. This is Kahmuk. You, you get it off these rocks, then you can either eat it raw or roast it over an open fire, roast it over the fire. Ever had them like that? Over no. a fire? Uh-huh. Uh, They're yeah. good. Or boiled in a pot. Or either boiled, boiled in a pot for, for about five minutes. Parents worry whether these children will be able to tell their children someday about the wild resources, the abundant life around their village. The oil spill was an ominous event. What's the long-term consequences going to be, and uh, what am I going to have left to pass on to my family? Uh, what are my kids going to be faced with in the future? And those concerns still have not been fully addressed. The fact that there's no FDA standards for being able to evaluate what are safe or acceptable limits of uh, PAH or hydrocarbon intake for the human body still hasn't been answered. And so the question of how safe is the food and what will its effect be long term are still not addressed. Much remains to be learned about the oil spill, about the effects of oil and other pollutants we discharge into the sea, and about ways to avoid discharging them. It is crucial that we find the answers. After all, subsistence is at stake.